Hello and welcome, or welcome back, to this ongoing series, Autism Spectrum Disorder in Three Dimensions. My name is James Copeland, MD, and I will be your guide to these materials. If this is your first time here, I suggest that you go back and look at some of the earlier posts to get yourself caught up. And if you've been following along and uh, you're returning for another post, thanks for sticking with me. Tonight, we're going to continue our discussion of the underlying neuropsychological mechanisms that we believe give rise to the outwardly visible symptoms that we call autism spectrum disorder. Remember, the term ASD is nothing more than a thumbnail or a shorthand for a collection of symptoms. And every few years or every decade, the nature of the symptom checklist changes a little bit. Some things come into favor, some things go out of favor, um, but we want to avoid becoming mesmerized by a specific checklist. Rather, what I'd like you to be able to do, what I'd like to help you to do, is to focus on some of the underlying neuropsychological principles that we think give rise to the outwardly visible symptoms. And that way you can play heads up baseball when you're trying to work with your child or trying to understand what's going on, perhaps with a family member or um, someone that you may know. Um, so without any further ado, let's jump in. Picking up where we left off last time, here we have our uh, submarine and above water, we see the periscope, part of the conning tower, or whatever else is uh, represented up here. And this represents, uh, for our discussion, the outwardly visible symptoms of autism spectrum disorder. But the bulk of the uh, interesting action is going on below the surface. Down here we have the neuropsychological mechanisms, the neuroanatomy, the genetics, the physiology, um, all of the other things that give rise to what we see up here. So the visible features are what I call the what. What do we mean when we say autism spectrum disorder? What does it look like? What's on the checklist of the, uh, the moment that um, you have to meet in order to meet criteria for a definition? And there are various checklists, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, there are school-based criteria. This is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Then there's the International Classification of Diseases and a variety of proprietary checklists like the MCHAT or the ADOS and um, the uh, CARS and so on. But to, to my way of thinking, what's more interesting and more fruitful is to talk about the underlying neuropsychological traits. These are the why. Why does somebody act the way they do? These traits have some explanatory power, in other words, to, to explain why people are acting the way they are. And perhaps more importantly than that, um, once we understand why somebody is acting in a certain way, that could lead us to insights regarding improved treatment and outcome. The most obvious or one of the cardinal visible features of spectrum disorder is impaired social interaction. And some of the most obvious uh, symptoms on almost any checklist would be things like poor eye contact, difficulty engaging uh, with the other person in a reciprocal interaction, and limited peer interaction, whether that's uh, with children on the playground um, or with uh, co-workers as an adult or classmates in school in between, and you pick any age you want. And the first underlying neuropsychological trait that we discussed was theory of mind, or uh, impaired theory of mind. Bear in mind, or recall if you were with me last time, that a theory of mind is a shorthand term for our ability to realize that other people have an internal emotional and intellectual life and point of view that may be different from our own. Most of us simply take that for granted and we're not even familiar with the term theory of mind because we don't need it because of course we, we realize that other people have their own thoughts and feelings, but that may not be obvious 
to somebody on the spectrum. So that's the, the term that we uh, use to describe that process. And then there's another thing, which is difficulty seeing the big picture. And we call that central coherence. Now, children or adults with spectrum disorder are often very good at seeing details, little details, specific details in, in uh, a situation. Uh, here is a, a box of crayons, and I brought these crayons out uh, to work with at the table uh, with uh, one of my patients, happened to be a little girl. She was about six years old. And I opened up the box and pulled these out. And what do you suppose the very first thing was that she said? The very first thing. Where are eight, nine, and 10? Well, if you count them, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and it says 10 chubby crayons. So she was very sharp. She was taking in the details. Now, her theory of mind skills were not good at all. And if you think back to last week, the ability to understand things like how it muffed the kitten feel if you gave her a bath, having just read the fact that she didn't like getting wet, but unable to figure that out, um, so she was very good at nailing all the little details, but not so good at um, theory of mind. And the same is true for seeing the big picture. People on the spectrum are often extremely good at picking out details, but not so good at seeing the big picture. If you recall this paper, this was uh, from several weeks ago, this is a paper by Leo Connor, who was a child psychiatrist at Johns Hopkins. And this was and probably remains the landmark paper in English that really lays out for the reader the uh, range of symptom expression in uh, young children. It's entitled um, Autistic Disturbances of Affective Contact. Affect means emotion, to be affectionate, emotion. Um, and you can get this paper by going to my website. Let's see, I jump ahead here. Go to my website, www.drcopeland.com. And on the left, there's a navigation bar, related links. You can click there. It'll take you to the page with uh, this link. Click on that, and you can actually download a copy of this paper for yourself as a PDF. But if we go back, one of the things that Connor said in this paper in 1943, reading skill is acquired quickly. And again, I think of my kids who could read. Muffet's a little yellow kitten. She drinks milk. She sleeps on a chair. She does not like to get wet. Reading skill is acquired quickly, but the children read monotonously. And a story or moving picture, i.e. movie, a story or moving picture is experienced in unrelated portions rather than in its coherent totality. And such was the influence of this paper on future thinking that that's where the term central coherence was born. We take this term directly out of Connor's 1943 paper. And just like theory of mind, this sounds like a big $10 term, sort of scary, central coherence, what does it mean? I'm gonna give you some examples that are gonna make it very, very clear what we're talking about. Oh, and you can also go to my book, which uh, there's a link to that on my website, and you can read about it more in there if uh, you would like. So here are some tasks that require central coherence in addition to theory of mind in order to come to uh, an understanding of what's going on. So what's happening in this picture? This is another painting by uh, the late Norman Rockwell. Norman Rockwell was an illustrator, very famous illustrator, painted a lot of covers for the Saturday Evening Post. And um, what's happening here? Well, we see three little girls. And this one has her mouth wide open. And if you look, you can see she's missing a tooth and her eyes are bugging out of her face. 
And to my way of thinking, she's got an incredible smile on her face. Now she's wearing a red dress, nice and bright. And then these other two girls are wearing green kind of color, you know, color coordinated. She's got green sneakers and yellow socks. She's got a green skirt and a yellow blouse, and she's got a green dress. So these two girls are on the left side of the picture. And you can see they're both looking in that direction. You can tell by their eye contact, the girl in the middle is kind of leaning forward. She's holding a couple of books behind her back. Well, this girl is holding something in her hand, some flowers it looks like, and uh, some sort of a tablet, uh, not a computer tablet, but a writing tablet maybe. That's what we used back in the day, or maybe a book. Uh, this girl also, you can't see actually her fingertips, but you can see down here, there's a book. So these are girls school age, perhaps going to school, perhaps coming home from school. And this one with her mouth wide open is the object of their attention. What is she doing? Well, she's showing off that she just lost a tooth. And you probably figured that out in the first two seconds I had this picture up on the screen. But this is the process that we go through in a blink. We don't really have to stop and think about it um, because uh, A, we have theory of mind skills, and B, we have central coherence skills, and C, Norman Rockwell was a terrific illustrator, and he's making use of things like the direction of the eye gaze and uh, subliminally the color coding that these two girls are looking at that one. These two are in green, she's in red, and so on, and they're looking right there, right into her mouth. Um, he's also used one of the, uh, the rule of thirds from photographic composition that you want to put the most interesting thing in the picture. If you divide the picture into thirds horizontally and into thirds vertically, then those points where the thirds intersect are typically, you want to pick one of them to put your most interesting material. So this is right about at the intersection of the upper third there and the right hand third there. So Norman Rockwell used all of those illustrator techniques. Uh, plus we bring to the experience of looking at the picture our own native skills. Now, so I show this picture to a child on the spectrum and I say, what's happening in this picture? And one child said to me, this girl, the girl is screaming. Well, why did he say that? Because her mouth is wide open. That's what he gets. That's his takeaway from this picture. This girl is screaming. Remember, last week we saw the picture of the boy on the diving board and he's leaning over the edge of the diving board, clutching the edge of the diving board. His eyes are bugging out. He's looking down at the water, but his mouth is covered by the tip of the diving board. And the boy said to me, I can't tell how he feels. I can't see his mouth. Remember that? Or you can go back and look at that if uh, you uh, weren't with us last week. So here again, um, the child is not getting any information at all from the uh, body language of this girl leaning forward. The other one has kind of a hesitant look and a hesitant expression. Maybe she's uh, afraid of losing a tooth or she feels left out. Well, that's hard to know. Um, but this one is clearly opening her mouth and very pleased to show off uh, what she has just lost. So another child said to me, that girl, the one over there, is trying to steal the other girl's book. What book is she talking about? These books right here. And this is something that came up over and over again. What this child was focusing on was the juxtaposition of her hands to these books. That's all that the child took in. None of the rest of the social dynamic or the fact that this girl has her mouth open or these two are looking over there. What this child was focusing on was the physical proximity of these hands to these books. And the child drew the conclusion that this one is trying to steal the other one's books. Didn't even notice, in fact, that she's already holding her own book down there. Now, here's another picture. You know, the previous one is very straightforward in the sense that they're just three girls. There's no background in the picture. It's just three girls on a white field. And uh, depending on how a child did with this one, I would bring out some more complex pictures. So this is another Rockwell painting. This is incredibly detailed. This is overflowing with detail. 
But if you remember from ninth grade art class about um, dis perspective, perspective drawing, and you have a vanishing point, which is invisible. The vanishing point is somewhere there, but you can see the, the road, the pavement, the buildings, the clapboard siding, the brick, everything converges toward that vanishing point. And we see this big broad expanse in the foreground with the dog. And another thing that we see is if you look all of these people, I actually started counting up how many people are looking at that dog. And I gave up. <laughs> They're just too many. But everybody in the picture, in fact, I noticed back here for the first time preparing for tonight's talk that here's another person. So a woman uh, leaning out the window, obscured by the truck. I never noticed her before. And... Uh, uh, the little baby over here, they're all looking at the dog. This guy's looking and he's pointing. Here are two kids. We can't see their eyes, but they're looking in that direction. This is either a policeman or a mailman. Um, this might be Rockwell himself. He often painted himself into the pictures, or maybe he's cropped out up here. We see the artist and his model um, very modestly covering herself for the painting. Um, and they're all pointing at the dog. The dog clearly is the focus of everybody's attention. And one child said to me, the man is trying to fix the truck. The man meaning this guy over here. And you know, the, the two moving men are dressed in their, their jumpsuits. But once again, this is a child who is focusing on the physical proximity of the man's hand to the bumper of the truck. And his interpretation of this picture was the man is trying to fix the truck. Maybe I can convince you of that general phenomenon by showing you uh, the answer that another child gave to me. He said, speaking of the, the uh, artist, he's cleaning the truck. And what he was referring to was the paintbrush, which you could imagine maybe is touching the, the window glass of the truck, although probably not. But the boy said he's cleaning the truck and the driver is distressed because it's taking so long. Now, the, the driver of the truck isn't looking at the man, but remember, uh, joint attention and direction of eye gaze is not high on the radar of uh, kids on the spectrum. So that's really immaterial. What that child was looking at was the physical proximity of the paintbrush to the truck. And that was his conclusion. And probably the closest answer I ever got from a child on the spectrum is this one. The man is playing with his dog. So at least the boy understood that the picture was all about the interaction between the man and the dog. But the boy totally missed the whole rest of the context. The truck can't go, true, because all the people are in the way. Um, sort of true, not really true. Uh, my interpretation, and probably yours, is that this uh, man, one of the two uh, moving men, is trying to beckon the dog out of the path of the truck so that the truck can go. But in order to, to appreciate that, you have to have central coherence as well as theory of mind in order for this picture to come together for you. Otherwise, it's just a jumble of unrelated stimuli and you're gonna take shots in the dark to try to figure out what's going on. So here's a storybook and you'll notice I've blotted out the title. I actually have a copy of this book and uh, you're looking at photographs of my copy of the book in which I did blot out all of the text that might have given any clues. I blotted out the title and the text on each of the pages. Let me just walk you through it. So here we see, well, you tell me what you see. The boy lying on the ground, surrounded by kittens. And um, he's got a pencil in his hand. He's got some paper in his hand. There's an envelope over here. And um, there are a couple of candles over here. And there's another cat, big cat over there. If your guess is like mine, this is the mother and these are the kittens. And he's writing a letter. I actually had one boy say he's writing an email. <laughs> kind of an interesting take. 
and this is one of those very old-fashioned things, an envelope. Now, you've got to remember that I'm talking about when I was in practice, which was five years ago and further back, and also I brought with me a prop. And here's the prop, right here. An actual physical envelope for snail mail. We didn't call it that in those days. And I put a big red uh, spot in one corner to simulate the spot that's in the corner in the book. And maybe you can see uh, on your screen, I have the red and white uh, hash marks around the outside. So I had a physical envelope to show the child to point out that these were the characteristics of the envelope of interest in the story. Then we go on to the next page and we see the boy and he's standing up on tippy toes and there are still mailboxes like this. I'll grant you this is more of an urban setting um, and there is the letter and remember just like the one that I showed you as my prop this one has the big red mark the big red seal and it's got the the blue and white margins around it to be a airmail. Along comes the postman, reaches into the mailbox, pulls out the letters, puts them in his bag. Here we see the postman walking down the street. Here he's dumping out his bag at the post office. And of all the letters that we see, this is the one that's prominently picked out with the big red seal and the red, white, and blue margins. Here it is again over here. Here we see bags of mail. Here we see the truck says U.S. mail. And uh, most of the kids uh, with whom I was using this book were of the age where they were able to read. They could read U.S. mail. Here we see uh, a policeman um, with his hands out. It's raining. Again, we see over here a very old airplane, DC-3 or something like that says uh, Air Express, U.S. Mail, U.S. Mail, bag of mail, goes into the plane. Now this is truly from another era. Um, the trains haven't carried mail since the mid-50s when uh, airplanes went out, and that was the death knell for passenger trains because that's really where the railroads made their money, uh, carrying the mail, not carrying passengers. Be that as it may, um, as I was going over this story with children, if they didn't get it, I would actually point out to them this bag and I would say, the letter is in the bag. And I would tell them that. And I would point out, look, he's got a big, what does this look like? And the kid would say, oh, a hook. And what's he going to do when the train comes by? Oh, he's going to grab the bag with a hook. They caught on to that. They, you know, kids are still into trains, especially my patients on the spectrum. And here we see a picture of the train. It's nighttime. It's a cutaway drawing. And here postmen inside the train in that what used to be called a railway post office car, RPO. And there's again that letter. And you can see uh, the artist used uh, composition rules to kind of draw your uh, eye to it. It's got the big red spot, the red, white, and blue perimeter, and so on. Then the train tracks. We don't actually see the train, but he's throwing the bag down. He's catching the bag. Then he drives along, teeny little post office. There's the letter again right on top. And look at all the stuff that he's got. Uh, chickens, pig, fruit, etc. And again, U.S. man. And he brings the chickens to her and he brings a box to her. And then we see this lady, old lady, sitting in her rocking chair. And she's got a picture on her nightstand. And then the last picture in the book, she has just opened a letter. It's the letter with the red spot. We're looking at the back side of the envelope and the postman is waving goodbye. So what is this story all about? Well, if you've been able to follow along the gist of the story, this is a story about a little boy who writes a letter and the letter takes a trip and the trip winds up at his grandmother's house. And at the very end, the grandma opens the letter. But now let's see how some of my patients perceived this story. <clears throat> and the title of the story, but uh, obscured here, is The Seven Little Postmen. And um, this is, was one of my favorite stories 
as a child. And you actually see here in dramatic foreshadow on the cover of the book all of the postmen that you're going to see when you get to the inside of the book. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yep, seven little postmen right there. Okay, so we go to page one, and I say to the child, what's happening in this picture? Now, you know, uh, if the child needs some guidance, I will point out, what is that, a cat, what are these kittens, um, and so on. A child, one child said to me, the boy is hoarding animals. Now, some of you may actually laugh because that's such an unexpected answer. And the child doesn't get it. He doesn't see the groupness. He doesn't see the coherent totality of the picture. What he sees is all the little elements, but he doesn't see how it all comes together. The boy is hoarding animals. And you can even see here, this kitten is looking at the paper. That one is looking at the paper. This one, it's not quite so sure. And another child said to me, the kitten is on the boy's back and is about to eat him. So of all the things in the picture, what he focused on is this kitten. And he's mistakenly concluding that the little kitten is about to take a bite out of the boy's back. Totally missing the big picture. And I want you to try to imagine what it would be like to go onto the playground or into the bathroom or into a classroom or into a birthday party if your ability to put things together is so limited. And another child, when I pointed this out, remember I had previously shown the child or I had right in my hand to show him an envelope and the child said, it's a rectangle with a triangle and an X on it. So, I mean, geometrically, that's true. It's a rectangle with a triangle and an X on it. But even with the prompt of a physical envelope, um, email hasn't taken over the whole world. Um, he still didn't really uh, catch on. And then we see the boy putting the envelope in the mailbox. And by this point, I will have pointed out the special nature of the envelope and showed the child uh, my sample envelope. And then we go to this page where the postman is reaching in and putting everything in his bag. And then I would say to the child, where is the letter now? And in order to answer that, you've got to have continuity. You've got to have story continuity in your mind. You've got to realize, well, he wrote it. The little boy wrote it. He put it in the mailbox. The postman, we see the postman reaching in and he put it in his bag. So it's got to be in the postman's bag. But um, without central coherence from page to page, you can't answer that question. You have no way of knowing. And again, here I will often, if the little child, if the child doesn't pick it out, remember, kids on the spectrum are very good at picking out little details. And by and large, they didn't have any problem picking out the letter because the letter has its own unique visual aspect. It's the only one in the whole story with that red, white, and blue uh, perimeter and the big red spot. And there it is over there. And they don't have much trouble spotting it. So here are bags full of mail, bags full of mail. And then we get to this page. Again, they can read by and large U.S. mail. Who is this man and what is he doing? And again, traffic policemen are something uh, of a thing out of the past, but not entirely. And kids watch old movies and uh, they watch, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Rogers and uh, um, Sesame Street, and they get to see uh, traffic policemen in those kinds of settings. He's yelling at the man in the truck, one child said to me. Or he's out in the rain without an umbrella. Why does he have his hand up? He has his hand up because he knows the answer. <laughs> That's kind of a sad echo of um, a classroom-based experience, I think. And then I will uh, prompt the child, what are these? They're bags. What do you suppose is in the bags? Oh, maybe the mail. And then we get to this one I've talked about. And this page we've talked about. And often they're okay with saying, oh yeah, there's the letter. And uh, there's a bag with mail and it says U.S. mail on the bag and it says it on the truck. It says U.S. post office there. It says U.S. post office over here. And here again. Uh, there's the letter, 
that doesn't present so much of a difficulty to spot and then all the animals and other stuff and yes he's bringing the chickens to her and who is this and what's happening here well she's reading a letter and then I get to my questions who is that a grandmother so this child knew that an old lady with white hair was kind of your paradigm for a grandmother. Whose grandmother is she? I don't know. Who sent her the letter? The policeman? And this is the point in the evaluation where if the parents are in the room, I almost found it impossible to make eye contact with the mother without bursting into tears myself, clearly. Uh, and it was usually the moms who understood. Um, sometimes both parents understood. Sometimes it was the mom who had the atypicality, um, more often the dad. But this is so compelling. And you don't pick this out on a reading aptitude test. The kid who read, Muff is a little yellow kitten. She drinks milk. She sleeps on a chair. She does not like to get wet. And then when I said, how would you feel if we gave Buff a, a, Muff a bath? And the child said, I don't know. We haven't got to that part of the story yet. You're not going to find this kind of a problem on a conventional reading test. You're going to find it on the playground and in the boys' room and in the cafeteria when the kid gets accused of being rude or disrespectful or, unfortunately, more likely than not, becomes a victim for the bully on the playground who senses an easy mark. So the children who didn't get it, who, you know, who, whose grandmother is she? I would turn back a page and I would say, can you find a clue? What is a clue? I would ask to make sure the child would know. Oh, a clue is something that helps you get the right answer. Right. Can you find a clue? And if the child didn't get it right away, I would say, what's this? Oh, it's a picture. What? Who, who's in the picture? Oh, a little boy. What little boy? I don't know. And if the child didn't know, then I would turn back to the first page and kind of I'm testing to optimize the child's performance. And sometimes at that point, the light bulb goes on and say, oh, that's the little boy from the beginning of the story. That must be his grandmother. <sighs> And we get the kid across home plate and it feels good at that point but that's the kind of method and we're going to talk a lot more in next week's post about instructional materials that are specifically geared to help children who have difficulty with central coherence and theory of mind and those instructional materials are designed to explicitly fill in some of this stuff that we assume kids would just know. Remember last week I told you about the boy who was not looking up when I was doing the flashcards and I, he was 15 years old. And I said to him, do you know that one way you can tell me you're ready is by looking up? And he said to me, no, uh, nobody ever taught me that. So you've got to have an awareness of where the, the deficits are. And I'm sorry for using a deficit model, but I think in reality, uh, I, I think it's fair to say that if you don't understand how to give and receive signals, that certainly puts you at a disadvantage. If you're a, a catcher for the Red Sox and you're suddenly playing um, for another team and you don't know the, the pitching signals that the other team is using, you're at a disadvantage. Hopefully after last week and this week, you now have a pretty good grasp of the terms theory of mind and central coherence as they apply to the world of autism spectrum disorder in childhood. They sound like highly technical terms, but when you take them into concrete uh, examples, uh, I do think they become pretty clear. I've written about them at greater length in my book, and you can find lots of other references on the internet. So I, I, uh, th this is just an introduction for you, but I would encourage you to think in these terms uh, because this is what gets you under the hood so to speak, in terms of things that your child uh, or you uh, as an adult uh, may be dealing with. Um, next week, I'm looking forward to sharing with you some of the uh, instructional materials that have been specifically designed 
to uh, help facilitate uh, uh, children's understanding, children who are struggling with uh, theory of mind and central coherence. So until then, thanks a lot for coming by.